what up, man? We here. We got a new series, the No Limit documentary, a Master P and the label that changed hip hop history. Pretty much this is gonna go from the time Master P was young to the time he became a multi-millionaire CEO of No Limit Records. Hey, I'm Mo that J. And before we go any further, shout out to the notification gang. Like I said, we're on that grind to 2,000 subscribers. If you want to be part of this notification game, hit your subscribe button, turn on your notifications so you get something every time I upload. And if you know me, I'm not gonna hold you up. So let's just jump right into this. This is Master P, episode one. The documentary starts off with Master P explaining his childhood and how he grew up in the Calio projects in New Orleans. I'm talking about it's bad. I didn't drove by it before, but it's real bad. His family didn't really have too much money, so they all lived with his grandparents. It was about 16 of them, including Master P, his three brothers, Kevin, C. Murder, Silk the Shocker, and his sister. So all of them lived in there. Like I said, it was a 16 people in the two bedroom house. P said he used to sleep on the floor. He was always the last one to eat. And sometimes he would go in there to eat. He would have just corn flakes and water because there wasn't nothing, they couldn't afford milk. He said his dad had a steady job. His mom was a nurse. So other than that, they were all in his house and you know, he really looked up to his grandparents. Also growing up, P went to a private school. It was a Catholic school right across the street from the projects where he had to go and he wore a uniform. So he'd say walking to school and walking home from school. Some days he had a fight just cause you know, all the other kids, that's all they knew, you know what I'm saying? They wasn't in no uniform going to school. So he said, hey man, you have to fight your way in and out of there. He also said when he was younger, he seen a man get shot outside his apartment complex. So he's always been traumatized. So that's one thing that's always been in the back of his head is just seeing people die. As he got into middle school, they always said Master P was a, he was a hustler at this time, just little Percy, but he hustling chips, selling water, doing everything he can. Cause he was like, man, I gotta make a little bit of money for my family. As he, growing up, he used to always be hooping. He said he would go outside middle of the night shooting basketball. He said the cops would come around and mess with him and they would shoot the lights out. And they would ask P, how would you know if your shot's going in? Hey, you gotta listen to the net, man. He'll just listen to the net and knew if he made it. Now we all know P was a nice basketball player. He made it to the league. I mean, he didn't play like no official games, but he was in the preseason and everything. So as he went to high school, this carried on with him. Everybody knew he could hoop. Him and his brother, Kevin, they hooping together. I mean, Master PSA was averaging 25 to 30 points a game. And he had all kinds of recruits coming to look at him, man, from all the big universities. Master P also said people used to bet, like all the dope boys, they would bet on the like, high school games and stuff. So one year he said they were getting ready to go to the state championship game, but they were tied 58 to 58 with one second left. And P said he's on the line. He has to make this free throw so they can win. But when he looks over at the door, there's a guy holding a gun saying, if you make this, you might not make it out of here. But he was like, man, if I don't make this shot, then I gotta go back to the hood and there's no out for me. So I'm gonna take my chances making this shot and follow my dreams. So P makes it and he says the whole team, they run and get on the bus so they won't get shot. <sighs> Whew. Can you imagine that? But along with that, P was living with his grandfather and him and Kevin, they knew that his grandfather had an illness so they had to take him to the, the VA hospital because he had high blood pressure. But when he gets there, they actually give him the wrong medicine and his grandfather dies. So for Master P, he's like, man, I gotta live with this. I just got, you know what I'm saying, my grandpa's dead. So he had to tell the whole family that his grandfather died. They walked to the hospital. So from this, he's like, man, I gotta, I gotta do something. So he actually goes to the University of Houston to go play basketball. Here's his freshman picture. Like, P A, -A that's what he wanted to do, man. He wanted to hoop. He told his family he's gonna get him out the hood. So, hey, he went to the University of Houston to play basketball. Master P's cousin Jimmy, AKA Hot Boy, is the man with all the work. P used to go with him to re up. Everybody used to go over to Jimmy to re up. So P said the first time he got some from some work from his cousin. He didn't know what he was doing, so he had a dope fiend come and rock it up for him. The dope fiend ended up stealing the money and the rock, so P was just like, ah, man, you know what I'm saying? He took a loss, but he got back out there, and he said he started building up customers. He said he's making thousands of dollars a day. P was the, the man on the street out here. He said uh, he saved up enough money. He ended up buying this red Audi, sweet little thing, but what he would do is, instead of parking it in front of where he lived, he would park three or four blocks down the street so it wouldn't be in the projects, you know what I'm saying? So it'd be a nice car on a regular street no one's really gonna mess with. Unfortunately, one day his grandma found it and broke all the windows out of the car, pretty much saying, hey, 
we ain't gonna be having no evil up in this house. We know how you get money, man. We heard something about drugs. Nah, we ain't having that. Unfortunately for P, he ended up tearing his ACL and he didn't get to play basketball. So he went back home to New Orleans and he ended up having his first son, Romeo, that we all know. And he ended up getting married. But while all this was going on, he's sitting there. He ain't working. You know what I'm saying? Basketball is done for him. That was his only out. So he has to get back in these streets. But he just sitting there listening. He just thinking back because his grandma once uh, told him, this is the black dress I'm going to wear to your funeral if you stay here doing this. So with Master P, he said he would ride around with two guns and he would have Romeo on the front seat. And he said one day he just stopped and started crying and was thinking about what his grandma was saying. And was like, man, I got a son. I need to get out of this. So he went, he went home, told his wife, like, hey, pack up. We gone. We headed to Richmond, California. His wife had a, a cousin out there. So they went to go stay with them at first. And hey, they took everything they did and got up out the hood and went to Richmond. But what they didn't know is Richmond was just as bad as the Calio, if not <laughs> worse. Once Pete got to Richmond and seen that it was pretty much the same thing that he moved from, he had to figure out what, what exactly he was going to do. And one day he was riding down the street and he seen a long line of people and he asked his boys like, hey man, what's that building over there? They're like, oh, that place sells records. So Master P seen that and was like, man, you know what? I'm going to start me a, you know what I'm saying, a record store. He ends up getting a $10,000 we can call it a loan, but pretty much when his grandfather died, his family filed a malpractice, you know what I'm saying, lawsuit, and they won it. So they gave the 10000 to Master P to go start his record, his record store. So he started No Limits uh, Studios, well, records, and he was just selling music out of that. But one thing that no one else was doing locally was selling any rap or gangster music. So what he did was he started getting all the local people, because he knew about Easy e and he knew that N.W.A. was doing their thing, but he, at this point, he wasn't putting out records. He was just selling records. So he would do consignment. So all kinds of Bay rappers, J.T. the Bigger Figure, E-40, you know what I'm saying? They're putting their songs, their CDs, well, cassettes, inside of the record. Boom, boom, boom. You know what I'm saying? Hey, we sold 100 of your CDs. Come pick up your money. So that's what he started doing. He started getting in good like that. He ends up running into a guy because he's thinking, all right, look, if all these dudes are rapping and making money, I can rap and make money. I live that life too. So he meets a guy named K. Lou. K. Lou owns a studio. He, he made beats for a lot of Bay Area rappers. So he's a well-known producer. And Master P didn't have any money at the time. So Master P told him, hey, man, whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. So K. Lou was like, all right, well, my mom needs her house painted. Master P was like, hey, man, I'll do it. You know what I'm saying? Because I, hey, I ain't got no money. They said they went outside and seen the painting of the house that he was doing. They said stop. But K. Lou said, man, since Master P, they had that hustle mentality. Hey, come on, I'll let you record it. So Master P's first song that he recorded is Mind of a Psychopath. That was his first studio album. That was his first record he recorded on his first album, The Real Untouchables. Hey, Master P was making moves at this point. Unfortunately, the music wasn't catching on or anything. It was just him putting out music. Boom, 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 boom. Let me keep putting out songs, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's what that's what I got to do. I just got to keep flooding the market. At this point, the record store is making enough money, you know what I'm saying? He's living all right. He was living in the back of it. He got a nice little apartment now, him and his wife. But he's trying to get his brothers out of New Orleans. So he sends for his brother Kevin, his brother Silk Shocker, and his sister. So Silk and his sister they make it out there but kevin he's still in the streets see murder's actually in the army at this time so he's gone but the whole time they're trying to get kevin there kevin ends up getting shot and killed so all of this is happening they got to go down there you know what I'm saying figure out what happened with that and see murder end up going awol to come back for the funeral so at this point see murder and silk they're out there and they got to come up with their names so they used to call master p Big Silk. So that's where Silk the Shocker got his name for him because he's the little Silk, you know what I'm saying? So he's Silk and he's, he's going to shock the world. See, Murder got his name because, of course, his name is Kurt, uh, Corey and he was overseas. So that's where the murder comes from. And P, where he got his from was, he said, man, I'm a master of everything I do. And P is his first name. So he was like, my name is going to be Master P. So at this point, he's like, all right, I got you guys in here. We rapping. I got a few more people, but 
we got to make something shake out here, man, because our, our music isn't really selling like that. It's just music in my store. So at this point, P store is selling music, but his music isn't really actually selling. But he's still doing like little local shows and stuff. He's from Richmond, California in Oakland. Like at that time, you couldn't be from Richland and go to Oakland or Oakland going to Richmond. It wasn't a, it wasn't advised or safe. But he takes his little crew with him, the few people that he know that's in TRU and his boy King George and Silk, and they all go to this little club in Oakland where they got to perform. But when they get in there, just like any other club in America, someone steps on somebody's shoes and a big altercation goes down. Everybody's in there fighting. They, <laughs> P runs out to the car, he goes out and gets his gun. He comes in, he cocks it and he shoots, but it jams. It jams again, so he runs out. He tries to shoot at him again. Boop, boop, click, 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 click. It's jamming. It, it just ain't working. So he drives off. He drops everybody off. He goes up under a bridge and he's angry. So he shoots the gun at the at the bridge and it actually shoots. But he's he thought this must be God's way of telling me, hey, I need to be doing something, leaving all this alone. Because if he would have shot in that club, the no limit that we know today would have never been around. That would have been the end of Mass P Silk the Shocker. But you made the right decision. All right, that's episode one of the 10 episode No Limit, how this label changed hip hop. Comment below what was something interesting or something you didn't know about Master P and how he grew up. I know there's a few things I ain't know, so hey, I was like, dang, that's cool to be able to see this in a documentary. I like, I like seeing documentaries about people that we grew up listening to. But hey, I'm Modi J. Like I said, thanks for watching. I'm on that grind of 2,000 subscribers. So if you like my content, please subscribe to my channel. Turn on your notifications. Share, comment, hit that thumbs up, all that good stuff. I'm Modi J. Be here for episode two. We're going to keep these things rolling. Thanks for watching. I'm out. Jimmy on the beat, boy.